tonight. If you're visiting with us, we want you to know that you are an honored guest and hope you can come back at any opportunity that you have. Our first song this evening is number 535. We'll sing all three verses. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land Tonight's scripture reading will be from Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. Let us pray. 
Our dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for allowing us to come back this afternoon. And we thank you for this day and for the worship we had this morning. We pray it was pleasing to you. And Father, help us always seek to do things the way that you would have us to do. And uh, help us always put you first in our lives because you are the most holy God. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who gave himself on the cross that through this amazing act of love will give, could give us remission of sins. We pray that we live our lives in such a way while we're here on earth that we can uh, get that reward one of these days and be in heaven with you. Father, we thank you for our song service tonight. We ask you to be with us as we sing praises to your name and glorify, glorify your, your holy name. We thank you for uh, Donnie, for the lesson he's about to uh, bring tonight. May it touch our hearts and make, always make us closer to you and that we always strive to do your will. We thank you for Cody and the work he does here at Ripley with the, our young people. We ask you to be with our young people and always keep them safe. And, uh, and Father, we just pray that they always be faithful to you and, and understand uh, what you have done for them. We ask you to be with uh, the sick uh, of this congregation. We ask you that having different diseases and medical problems, and we just ask you to be with each one of them and, and bless them. And Father, if be thy will, heal them and help them get through this, and and be with those that's having medical uh, procedures this week. Just uh, we pray that everything works out good for them, and and uh, just bless the doctors that work with them. Father, we sin, we fall short of the way that we should uh, live. We ask you to forgive us of our sins and help us uh, when we become weak, weak to rely on you and, and put our faith in you and overcome sin. Father, be with us uh, throughout the further exercises of this serv service. Be with us this coming week and help us to be... Uh, Christ-like this week. These things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Psalm before the lesson tonight will be number 625. Number 625, we'll sing all three verses. Signs cold, swimming rain, covered by the
number 628, number 628. When you open the pages of Scripture, you'll see that on the seventh day, God rested. And on that seventh day then, He sanctified it and made it holy. Because upon that day, God rested. You go a little bit further and you see that there was this place upon which God stood in a special way in which He beckoned Moses to come. And when Moses approached that area, God said, To take off thy sandals from off thy feet, for the place upon which thou art standing is holy ground. It was holy because God was there in a special way. You go on a little bit further and you see that God has designed a holy place. A place that we know of as the temple. And the furniture in the temple and the places in the temple and the function of the temple was all described as holy because God was there in a special way. You go inside the temple and you see the candlestick. You see the Ark of the Covenant. Rather, you don't. But you know the Ark of the Covenant is there. And you know these things are holy because God is there in a special way. And you see the priests. When you look at those priests, you know that they are holy. They're different. There's something special about them, but it's not them really. It's, it's because God's using them in a special way. So as we go through Scripture, one of the major things that we need to recognize is that God is holy. And those things that pertain to God, those things are holy as well. Now, holy is to be differentiated from things that are common, things that are Profane is the old word, but we just say common today. Maybe even you'll use the word vulgar. The old Latin vulgate, for example, was a translation from Greek into Latin that was given in the common tongue. So they called it the vulgate because it was the common tongue. This is the way we get vulgarities in our own language whenever you're speaking like a common person and not like a child of God. But we understand as we think about things that are holy that there's something different about them because they're associated with God and now you look at everything else where it's different because it's not associated with God in that special way. You see then that if something or someone or some place or some day is going to be holy, We understand that it's holy because it is associated with God in a special way. But God is the only one who is just by His nature holy. God is the only one who can make other things holy. God is the only one who is truly just holy, holy, holy. That's why Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the cherubim said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with His glory. Because God and God alone is just different. He is distinct. He is separate from everything else. In fact, the word holy really just means to be separated. It's kin to the word Pharisee, but our Bible word holy just means to be separate, to be different, to be distinct from. And so God is utterly distinct from everything and everyone else. But as we come into a relationship with God, as we are sanctified, as we are hidden by His blood, as we are hidden in Christ when we are baptized, as we are living by faith, then we are holy. Not because we ourselves, by virtue of ourselves, are holy, but because we are in Christ and Christ is holy. Because He is God. So as we look at this concept of holiness tonight, I want us to look together in Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15. Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15, the Bible says, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, 
who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also then with him who is of a contrite spirit and a lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. So as you look here in Isaiah, we see that God, proper, properly speaking, has two homes. That He can be at home with Himself, but because He is holy in a special and loving way, as He brings us into His own presence, He is also able to be at home with His people. But if we're really going to appreciate what it means for us to be at home with God, we first need to focus on this idea of God being holy. If God is holy, what does that really mean? You see, at the very beginning of the verse, God's transcendence is displayed. He is the one who is high and lifted up. He is the one who inhabits eternity. He is the one who dwells in the high and holy place, and therefore His name is holy. Each one of these descriptions emphasize the, the difference, the distinction between all of us that are creatures and then God who is the Creator. Someone said that as we look here at God's holiness, we remember that we are fickle and apply our minds sometimes to one thing and then to another. And our hearts do not continue to be focused upon God where they should be. But we flutter between this and that. But not God. Instead, God is that which inhabits eternity. God is the one who is truly holy. God is the one who is everlasting and everlastingly the same. And so God just by, very his, by His very nature is different. Different to the degree that we really can't understand it and different to the degree that we really can't describe it. But here language itself tries to do what language can. As we see first, God described as high and lifted up. Now, as God is described here as high and lifted up, this, of course, pertains to God's existence in relation to His creation. Before creation came, God is just God, but now that creation has been created by God, in comparison to all that there is, God is high and lifted up. God is high and exalted. He is superior in every single way. He is better than we could ever imagine. And for us to begin to begin to get the full picture of God, we've got to strain our necks looking up at His majestic holiness. But as soon as we do, even looking up at His majestic holiness, we are reminded already that we are creaturely weak and sinful and do not deserve to look up and to see Him, but to behold Him. And so in relation to us, our God is high and lifted up. We also understand from this that it is God alone that should be placed on that level. God alone should be placed upon this altar in our lives. Because we find ourselves tempted to create various things for us to worship. We find ourselves tempted because our hearts are a continuous factory of idols. We're always producing something else that can get between us and our God. But since God is high and lifted up, God is high and exalted above His creation, He is the one that we're always supposed to be looking at. He is the one that we're always supposed to have our eyes on because He is far above everything else. This God who is high and lifted up, the Bible then says, inhabits eternity. I think this is a very literal translation. Some other translations will have something like lives forever. It's a rather difficult Hebrew phrase. But as we look at this, we see what is being described is the description of God as a continuing life or having life in its root in itself. And so these Hebrew words mean the eternally dwelling one, or he whose life lasts forever and is always the same. 
It's odd for us to think about something that's always the same in exalted ways. Because typically, whenever we think of something that's always the same, we think about something that's inert. We think about something that can't move or can't do any better. But when we describe God as always being the same, it's because He is always as great as greatness can possibly be. He is always the fullness of life. And so we understand then that God is the one who lives forever, or God is the one who alone really inhabits eternity because eternity exists because a God exists. That it takes something infinite like eternity to describe what it is for God's life to be. Because God's life is infinite. It is without bounds. It is the simultaneous enjoyment of a complete, full, and perfect life. It is everything all at once. It is every hope and dream that we might have, every idea of perfection, all summed up into one divine character in our God. He dwells in eternity, and He alone. He lives forever. Jonathan Edwards looked at this verse, and in his little notes on Scripture, he concluded that to live forever or to inhabit eternity is the eternal state of His own infinite glory and blessedness in which the persons of the Trinity dwell together infinitely above heaven and in which they ever did dwell. I love all of that, but Edwards, as is typical, is somewhat hard to read. But as you look at it, you can see this eternal state of His own infinite glory. This is what God always is. And He will never be anything but that. The eternal state of infinite glory. This is what it means for God to dwell in eternity. This is what it means for God to be holy. And so as we look at this God, He is the very fullness of life. He is the one who has no weakness. There's nothing accidental about Him. Instead, everything is just the full perfection of being. All of that's hard to grasp. But we begin to do so as we begin to describe God again as holy. As He dwells in these high and holy places. These high and holy places aren't physical places. It's just where God is. Because God is high and because God is holy, because God is exalted. Wherever God is, that place is holy. This is why Isaiah says simply, His name is holy. His name, His essence, His nature, His character... God is holy. And so holiness is one of those unique words that we can use to describe every attribute of God. We can talk about God's holiness and refer to His love, His wrath, His mercy, His goodness, His knowledge, His power. It's all summarized in the idea that God is holy. He is above, He is distinct, He is high and lifted up, He is exalted. That is our God. He is inexpressible in His greatness, inexpressible in His perfection. But you can see here even Isaiah using language to the very best of His ability as inspired by the Spirit to try to point out the boundlessness of God. But the boundlessness of God, the holiness of God, is exactly what we rely upon for us being made holy. Because when you think about God being infinite, one of the strange things that you've got to come to terms with is that God's infinity means that God is everywhere. He's everywhere. He is absolutely everywhere. A little thing I like to think about sometimes is that because God is everywhere, God cannot leave. Not really. Because He's omnipresent. He's infinite. God cannot leave. 
You and I are finite. We can be here or we can be there. But God is infinite. He's everywhere. And so His infinity, His infinitude, His holiness is not just something that's out there, but His holiness is something that's everywhere and it runs over and fills everything. So the psalmist said, the whole earth is filled with His glory, just like the cherubim did in Isaiah 6. Now, based upon this principle, we understand that God manifests Himself in special ways so that His holiness is seen more there in the Old Testament and on Mount Sinai with, at the giving of the law, there in the Old Testament at the burning bush, there in the Old Testament at the temple. But now God's holiness is displayed in special ways in us. So we see that God makes His creation holy. So God's holiness does not make Him aloof. Instead, God's holiness spills over to give life to His creatures. This life begins at creation, but it is improved in new creation when we become new create creatures in Christ Jesus. So Isaiah here is describing here that very reality, that the one who dwells in the high and holy place also dwells with us. So let's look for a moment at who it is that the holy God dwells with. Isaiah says he dwells with those who are of contrite heart. Contrite or contrition, these aren't words that we use all the time. But it runs into what we have been studying in Matthew chapter 5 with the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. You see this act of contrition, this attitude of contrition, where we are turning away from sinful things and beginning to turn to the holy God. Just as Moses was there shepherding his flock, he had to turn away from his sheep to turn, away, turn to his sacred mission given by his sacred God. So it is with us that as an act of contrition with this contrite heart, with this contrite spirit, we mournfully turn from the sins that we have committed so that we can joyfully turn to the God who wants to forgive us and save us from our sins and exalt us in glorification. God dwells with those people. God dwells with those people who are contrite. God dwells with those people who are of a lowly spirit. Again, this idea of lowliness has to do with humility and meekness. Jesus says, blessed are the meek. Here we see this same principle again, that the meek shall inherit the earth. And as we look back here in Isaiah 57, we see that the meek are inheriting the places where God is because they are the place where God is. So whenever we look at this concept of being lowly in spirit, we first understand what it means for us personally. That we understand that we must have our attitudes, our emotions in check. That we are not proud. We're not prideful. That's the opposite of being lowly, isn't it? Because whenever you are prideful, we even describe it like this. That so-and-so's got their nose up in the air. They look down their nose at me. They are too proud. The Christian has no need for that. The Christian has no desire to live that way. Because as Christians, we understand the holiness of God a bit better. We understand our sinfulness as a very real reality in our own lives. And these attitudes, these recognitions, cause us to be lowly. They cause us to be humble. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't have a healthy self-respect. We are made in the image of God, and we're told, told to love other people the same way that we love ourselves. This means that we need to have a healthy self-image as God's image bearers. But at the same time, we're not too proud. And at the same time, we're not too mournful. We're not too cast down. When we are focusing on God, 
we are both overwhelmed with the fact that He is gracious to us as sinners, and we are overwhelmed with the fact that He has glorified us as His people. Both aspects then go into what it means to be holy and to be lowly. But then we have this great purpose statement that God is holy. God dwells with His people. God dwells with the contrite. God dwells with the lowly of spirit to revive their spirit and to revive their heart. Not to overwhelm you with guilt, but to make you feel better, to make you to have life. You go back to the prophet Ezekiel, and you see there Ezekiel given this vision of the valley of dry bones. And the Lord speaks to Ezekiel and says, Son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel says, Oh Lord, you know. He says, Prophesy to the bones. And they begin to come together and they prophesy to the bones. The sinews and muscles come upon them, prophesy to the bones. And then immediately we see this great army standing up for God and for His glory because Ezekiel had preached, because the Spirit of God had been given over to these dead bones, and now they're made alive. You see that prophecy there in Ezekiel finds this great fulfillment as Christ comes into the world and He brings life to His creatures. He brings life to His creation. The beautiful prologue of John's Gospel. There we see that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That there is nothing that has been made that's not been made through Him. But then when we see Jesus coming into the world, the Son of God coming into the world, taking on flesh and dwelling among us, we see again that the world beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Having seen God, can you imagine what that would be like? Can you imagine the enthusiasm for Christ? Can you imagine the enthusiasm for His work, for the church, for the kingdom? Can you imagine the hope that is instilled for heaven because you've been able to see the Lord? Wonderful to think about, isn't it? But Jesus says that He has to go away so that something better can happen. He says, when I go away, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to you, and this is going to be even better. So as we are here holding this miracle of God's Word in our hand, as we read about these precious promises, knowing that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, knowing that Jesus promised to dwell with us forever and forever and forever to the end of the age, knowing that we are yet with God, we are still overwhelmed, aren't we? We are still overwhelmed with the very fact that the One who is life is dwelling with us and giving us life. This is why we go back to Isaiah now, and we see that the Holy One is able to dwell among us and to make us holy, to make us to have life. God then has two homes. He is at home in His holy perfection. And He is at home with those who He has made holy. The question for us, though, is will we be at home with God? Can we begin to be comfortable being in God's presence? It's a rather uncomfortable thing to think about, isn't it? You look through Scripture and every time people are in God's presence, the first thing that always comes to their mind is fear. Because as God told Moses, no one can see me and live. We see all throughout Scripture this fear of being in the presence of God because He is holy. His holiness was something dreadful. But as we are made holy in Christ, we get to the book of Hebrews and we see that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Isn't that incredible? What God has done for us. What God has done so that we can be with Him, so that we can be in His presence, so that we can be called His children. As John says, and which children you are, 
giving that extra for affirmation because we need that, don't we? We need to be reminded that we are His people because when we look at God, we're overwhelmed with His perfection and our imperfection. But when we look at Christ, when we look at the Son of God, we are overwhelmed with His sacrifice and with our own glorification so that we can be at home with God. So as our Lord said, not to be anxious. Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many places for us to dwell together. And I am going to a, prepare a place for you so that where Jesus says, where He is, there we can be as well. Don't you want to be at home with God? As we live this life to be at home with Him, to be comfortable in His presence, but also to look forward to being with Him forever and forever in glory. So tonight, if you're not a Christian, you need to be saved. You need a Savior. You can't save yourself from your sin. You depend upon Jesus entirely. And your Savior has come to this world to make you holy so that you can be saved from your sins. He died upon that cross and was raised again on the third day and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And the one who is seated at the right hand of Father as King of kings and Lord of lords says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be condemned. This is what your Lord said. So why not then be saved? Why not then become a Christian tonight as our Savior bids you come? Won't you come as together we stand and sing? If the name of the Savior is precious to you, if His care has been on God, but I want to talk to you about the food. The food is just a good old-fashioned potluck tomorrow, okay? So no teams are in charge of food. You are in charge of food. Y'all remember how to do a potluck? Y'all remember how that works, where you just bring food and everything works out all right? Well, that's what we're going to do tomorrow night. At 6.30, we'll start eating, and while y'all are eating, I'll start talking. That's the plan, okay? 6.30, bring your friends, be plenty of room. Uh, we'll be glad to have absolutely everybody if you'd like to come tomorrow night at 6.30. Again, we'd like
like to welcome all of our visitors that we have tonight and want you to come back and worship with us every opportunity that you have. I have just a few announcements this evening before we conclude our services. We'd like to extend our sympathy to the family of Twyla Jo Fleming. This was um, the aunt of Michelle Elliott and Sonny Meeks and a cousin to uh, Clay Crawford. She passed away and her funeral was this past Thursday in Holly Springs. There is a table set up in the foyer for Nellie Wallace, who will be arriving this July to join her proud parents, Stephen and Hannah, and her big sisters, Emma and Marley. There will be a baby shower for Dana Morton Gray in the Fellowship Hall on Sunday, June the 12th. That's this upcoming Sunday from 2 until 3. It is a girl, and they are registered at Babyland in Tupelo and Amazon. You're invited to the wedding of Emily Rogers and Blake Alsop on Saturday, June 25th at 5 p.m. at Faye Whitmore Farms in Jasper, Alabama. A reception will follow. Please RSVP by emailing your name and number of guests to the Alsops0625 at gmail.com. And we'll have this placed uh, in the bulletin and uh, in the foyer as well for you to be able to get that email address. Also remember, VBS is coming up uh, at the end of this month from June 26th through the 29th. Uh, there's a list for those who are willing to help with food or working in the kitchen. That list is in the uh, exit to the north. Uh, if you would please uh, look at that, and if you can help with any of that, uh, we would like that very much. Cole Chapman is going to be going on a mission trip next month to El Salvador. If you would like to help, please uh, give your contribution to one of the elders or deacons. And we're pleased to announce that Caleb McMillan is working with Cody and our youth group as an intern this summer. And we're thankful for Caleb and his uh, abilities and, and wanting to do this. And also, we'd like to wish happy birthday to Allison Estes, whose birthday is today. Again, we thank you for being here, and uh, Dan will come and lead us in our closing song. If you were here uh, tonight and were unable to partake of the Lord's Supper, you may be dismissed at this time or when we're singing the closing song. If you'll exit the foyer and go to your right, the last room on your left, and someone will be there to assist you. Brother Dan. Closing song this evening is number 639. If you will, please stand. We'll sing the first and last verses. Number 639. <clears throat> Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin and the rain. We for the erring one, lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus, our mighty to save. Rescue Jesus' name we pray. Amen.